one. I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled the Cyber Information Sharing and Public Policy. Uh, my name is Steve Warzala, and I am the CSIAC Outreach Manager. Uh, a couple of quick administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Second, questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables the CSI Act to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. John Bay. John is currently serving as the Executive Director of the Cyber Research Institute, the CRI, which is located in Rome, New York. The CRI is a not-for-profit research corporation chartered by New York State. Its mission is to perform and disseminate cybersecurity research for the benefit of the public. Previously, Dr. Bay has been a professor of electrical and computer engineering, a program manager at DARPA, and the chief scientist of the Air Force Research Laboratory's Information Directorate. John has uh, held senior positions in both large and small businesses, and he's also an IEEE fellow for his contributions to model-based embedded systems. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Bay. Good afternoon, John. The floor is yours. Thank you, Steve, and, and uh, thank you to everybody at the CSIAC. Uh, I'm pleased to have uh, what I understand is a very good audience, and so I hope to respond with a, with a uh, interesting and engaging presentation. Uh, as the title would indicate, this is not a, an in-depth examination of particular cybersecurity technology, uh, malware analysis, or things like that. Uh, but it is a, a topic of great current interest. And this is something that if you uh, watch for the news and public policy, you'll see a lot of dialogue. And that will be that level of discussion will be increasing in the next month. As I'll explain, there are some issues before Congress when the uh, session begins next month in, in September. So. Going right ahead, uh, I am going to, going to introduce a little bit of the, the background of the Cyber Research Institute itself, as well as myself. Uh, Steve provided a, an excellent introduction and, and background, so you get a, a, uh, an understanding of, of where I may have come across these topics in the past. But the context of what the CRI does and what I have done in recent years provides a little bit of a, of a better understanding of the perspectives I'm going to be providing. I've uh, looked at cybersecurity from lots of different sides, and I think understanding those perspectives will help get through the presentation uh, in a little more depth. Uh, of course, the, the bulk of the presentation will be on the topic of cyber information sharing itself. But then in the, in the end, I want to look forward and present an idea. By the, by the time we get through the presentation, I, I hope to have explained what kinds of information sharing processes and organizations are out there, and maybe a little bit about the difficulties that I foresee in their operations and success. And we've got our own ideas and suggestions for modes of information sharing, organizations for information sharing, policy for information sharing, and potentially uh, legislation as well. So a little bit about the Cyber Research Institute. Uh, Steve mentioned we are a not-for-profit 501c3 organization doing research for the public good. The story of the CRI is a fairly new one. We were created in 2012 uh, and signed all the paperwork and, and established as a corporation in 2013. And we grew out of a discussion that occurred in Rome among 
the members and, and board members of the Cyber New York Alliance, which is a uh, trade organization that represents the contracting and research community around the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate. And the conversation turned to the, the key ingredients of a successful research ecosystem. And it was recognized that there are really three legs to that stool. There's a, an economic engine, which we had in Rome, the AFRL Information Directorate, and there was a strong contractor community, which, well, any time you have a, a, a large uh, government research lab, you will likely have a, a, a viable contractor community. But there also has to be an independent research component. And here in central New York, we're in the, the centroid of a lot of, of very fine institutions of higher education, PhD granting institutions, research organizations. But FRL, and because of the cyber nature of its research, really engages more in a distributed sense with the research community. The Information Directorate, which is affiliated with the Information, or excuse me, the Information Institute, which is affiliated with the Information Directorate, is an organization of about 80 universities, and they're all across the country. So it's much less geographically oriented and much more logically oriented around Rome. However, as many of you will know, there's no substitute for physical proximity to program managers and being able to visit the research campus and a few face-to-face -face meetings every now and then. And so the CRI was created to facilitate that on-site presence. We will interface and, and uh, collaborate with any research organization, university, private, uh, for-profit, not-for-profit, that wants to engage in the federal cybersecurity research community and not just the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate, but DARPA, IARPA, DHS, NASA, what have you, uh, even in the basic research agencies such as AFOSR, ONR, National Science Foundation. And the way we can support the not-for-profit charter to do research in the public interest is to bring say, non-traditional researchers to those federal programs or on the more applied and transition federally funded research and development into the public and private economic sectors uh, or uh, some of the activities that we, that we perform, we can actually host research here and that's one of the ways that we bring in non-traditional performers. Uh, the, the Cyber Research Institute can host visiting researchers, we have space, we have facilities clearance, we can provide security clearances uh, and broaden the reach of the federal labs out into the, the research community far beyond Rome and beyond New York State. So uh, I mentioned I wanted to say a little bit more about my background. Uh, this is a, a kind of a a, a diverse, multifaceted story. I started off in academia. I taught for 11 years at Virginia Tech doing control systems and robotics, and then went to Raytheon. Those of you, I know I have some participants calling in from the Washington area. This was the Raytheon E-Systems in Falls Church, where we did intelligence work and more C4ISR. And my own personal role was to interface with DARPA. And so uh, many trips up and down Wilson Boulevard. One day I decided not to go back to Raytheon and I stayed at DARPA for four years in the ITO and IXO offices. And that's where I really got engaged in unmanned systems and embedded systems. But as you may know, DARPA employment terms are limited by law. In my case, under my hiring category, it was for four years and I had developed a relationship with the AFRL Information Directorate and it just so happened that the chief scientist at the time, Nort Fowler, was retiring. So I moved up here to the pleasantly cool north, where, as opposed to doing unmanned systems and embedded systems, we got much more involved in cybersecurity and intelligence work. After four years there, I returned to private industry to a small business here in Rome. AIS Incorporated is their chief scientist. And then in uh, 2000, 13 and 14, I transitioned here to the Cyber Research Institute. 
So this is, you know, I don't want just a, a pictorial history of my own career, but uh, the implications. I spent about half of my career on the provider side of research funding and about half on the applicant side of research funding. And I spent roughly a third in academia, a third in industry, and a third in government. And that's what has given me sort of a, a circumspect view to research. It's uh, multidisciplinary. I like to bring in different fields of study. We'll see in a, in a, a short time how I brought in some life sciences and my, my history. And I've done some biomechanics and control theory and, and systems theory, and that all factors into the, the high-level look that I have at cybersecurity and why that has evolved into a policy question. Well, the topic of the day is, is cyber information sharing. And I wanted to start with, with what the law currently is. And in essence, there is very little law. The, the, the main topic at hand with federal legislation is that there is no cyber information sharing law. There have been attempts. There have been 12 attempts. They have all failed. The 13th has been introduced and was in committee for a long time. It, it did not reach the floor for a vote in the past legislative session. There has been a promise to put it on the floor for a vote in the current legislative session. But uh, I'll say right up front, I'm a little skeptical of quick passage uh, for various reasons. There are some inherent difficulties that I'll discuss about the specific bill, but also there are 22 amendments that are pending that have not been discussed either in committee or on the floor, and these include some important things like uh, strengthening the privacy aspects, uh, changing the specifications, what government agencies can see cybersecurity information that gets shared. That might include, it certainly will include the Department of Homeland Security. It might also include the FBI and the Secret Service. And that raises a lot of questions with people, as we'll, we'll talk about. Some time ago, I found some very nice summaries of the various types of cybersecurity legislation. Now, of the 12 that were introduced and failed, uh, Several of them were very similar to one another. There were variations on a theme, and I've, I've excerpted here on this slide uh, a couple of lines taken from snapshots of a document produced by the American Civil Liberties Union. And in the columns, it, it identifies bills in the past. I think this particular publication was in 2012, so it was the bills up to that point in time. And as, it, as you go through the document, there were rows indicating in a comparative way across this matrix what information can be shared within this bill, who can receive the cybersecurity information, how can it be used and distributed, what is the nature of the monitoring and or surveillance, is there somebody authorized to take countermeasures? And something that's a, a big sticking point for the public is the, the issue of is there liability protection and immunity against prosecution for either violating the law or for losing data uh, that is particular data, uh, data covered by privacy acts, data that includes personally identifiable information or personal health information, and what conditions under which that liability is uh, granted. Is it granted just for joining an information sharing organization? Is it granted for submitting shared information? Uh, is it granted as blanket immunity for all cases. And that changes by law. So that's something that the authors and the public will have to uh, examine in the current bill, which is, is called the CISA, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. 
that's coming to the to the floor of Congress. So where the law is lacking, there is practice. There is a community of cyber information sharing organizations, but so far they're all voluntary. The big ones include uh, the U.S. CERT, which is affiliated and supported by the Department of Homeland Security. The successful operation of this center seems so far to be on critical infrastructure systems and what uh, security incidents those organizations are seeing. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and, and Technology, issues a number of guidelines on the proper handling of security incidents, how they should be shared, how the data is structured, how uh, information is transmitted. Those of you who have done risk assessments or penetration tests know that NIST, the NIST 800 series, this is a screenshot of the NIST 800-61 incident handling guide, but there are lots of, of checklists and guidelines that NIST publishes on handling cybersecurity incident information. There's going to be, a, a, I think, in the next few months, an increase in the number of agencies that advocate and incentivize their constituents to join information sharing organizations. Here recently, uh, I know the Federal Trade Commission has indicated that uh, public companies that offer information privacy policies, uh, now you install an app, there's a privacy policy, you check that you accept it or you don't accept it. The FTC has decided to put some teeth in that privacy policy. If you accept that policy and it obligates the owner of that information to protect it, and that doesn't happen, then those companies are liable for, actually, it's a, uh, as it stands, it's civil suit. It's not a criminal penalty. And the SEC, as you see here on the headline from a couple of years ago, is, is planning to make that mandatory for uh, publicly traded companies where, where securities are involved. Other kinds of, of information sharing organizations, some of them are specialized, some of them are very general. Many, I'm sorry, I paused. I got a note that my screen has stopped sharing, but I see I'm back up. Um, there are many centers gathered under the concept of Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or an ISAC. These are voluntary organizations, and they're industry sector specific. There's a financial services ISAC. There's a healthcare uh, provider ISAC. There is a critical infrastructure ISAC. Uh, there's one hosted up in up here in New York and Albany, the multi-state ISAC, multi-state actually includes localities, uh, I think it's the local, regional, state, or tribal municipalities that join the multi-state ISAC. So that provides an information sharing mechanism where the individual industry sectors do not cover that, that particular interest area. All of those ISACs are, well, some of them are supported to a greater degree by the Department of Homeland Security. Some of them operate relatively independently. Uh, some of them penetrate quite a lot of the industry sector. Uh, the claim is that you see here many reaching over 90% penetration in the industry sector. So they're very successful, but they are sector specific. One of them is the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity and Information Assurance Program. This was a shot from a memo, uh, a screenshot from a memo from the, from the Deputy SecDef encouraging DOD components to encourage their eligible cleared contractors to consider participating in voluntary DIB cybersecurity program. The reason for that is it's been very successful. The defense industry in general has a, a slightly fewer reservations about sharing cybersecurity information because they've, they're much more accustomed to uh, placing the security interest above the privacy interest if that happens to be the, the concern. And this is the, the DIB is held up as a, as a great example of a very successful 
ISAC that still is, is industry specific. There are other information sharing organizations that are not industry specific. The NCFTA in Pittsburgh is one. Uh, I believe at my, um, the last time I looked in, there were several dozen members. Uh, I think the, the, the operating model is that this is uh, member oriented and the, the members are charged a fee, but also they're encouraged to place personnel co-located there at the center and they found that they get a lot of benefit from having cybersecurity analysts, malware analysts, um, threat intelligence professionals all at the same place. Similar is something called the Advanced Cybersecurity Center that some of the personnel at the uh, MITRE Corporation in Boston established. This is also cross industry sector but it happens to have evolved regionally. So it's a, a little bit a different slant on the, the dimensionality of an of a information sharing center. There are several industry sectors. I think they've got 30 members in the ACSC. Currently it is member based, so it operates based on fees. The fees are assessed in proportion to the annual revenue of the members. And they provide not only information sharing and threat analysis and intelligence threat intelligence dissemination but there are some training functions there are monthly or perhaps bi-weekly telecons um, there are biannual workshops there are seminars and 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 public events to disseminate information this is something that i want to focus on the value of that information dissemination function for information sharing organizations so shifting gears a little bit, uh, why is it that I focused on information sharing as an interesting problem? This was something that came to my attention in a seminar some years ago. I'm afraid I don't even remember what the context was. But I got very interested in epidemiology. And in particular, it started with the original outbreak of Ebola in 1976 it actually had not been recognized as a virus much before then i think it was isolated as a virus just a couple of years before then and interestingly after 1979 it went away it wasn't seen for many years and then it came back again and is a very deadly virus there was the outbreak just last year uh, i think they declared that not over but under control it's not spreading anymore However, the most recent outbreak, uh, I think there were approximately 25,000 victims that contracted Ebola and, and almost 11,000 of them died. So it's, it's a very deadly disease. And no matter what you see on the news, it's not all that contagious, transmissible, I think is the, is the better term. There are some cultural reasons for it spreading. Uh, some of the cultures in the African nations where Ebola regularly re-emerges and spreads, include a ceremonial washing of bodies within the family. Um, there are ceremonies involving uh, the, the corpses of the deceased. And of course, as, as I think we all know, the primary means of transmission for Ebola is contact with bodily fluids. Outside of contact with bodily fluids, it's relatively hard to catch Ebola. It's not transmitted through the air. It will not survive outside of a living being. And that's why it's kind of interesting to study the epidemiology of it. Those years where Ebola goes away, where does it go? It's inside of a living organism somewhere, and to this day, nobody knows where it goes. There was a uh, another interesting outbreak, just coincidentally. Uh, the first being in 1976, and uh, another one just recently, I believe that's coincidental, the Legionnaire's disease. The picture of the building there is the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in downtown Philadelphia. There was an American Legion convention in 1976, and the gentleman you see lying in the hospital bed came down with flu-like symptoms. His body temperature was almost 106 degrees. So if you've got um, any medical 
background or familiarity at all, you know that's almost an un, uh, unsurvivable uh, level of fever. That gentleman in the picture did survive, but that got a lot of people's attention. You see the cover of the weekly magazines at the time. Turns out when that uh, first victim fell ill, if you were watching the national news within 48 hours, you saw the top headline that there is this unknown, unisolated disease spreading through Philadelphia. Uh, everybody be on the lookout. Of course, was not great business for the Bellevue Stratford. I think they've since changed their name and, and they still exist as a hotel, but it, they had a public relations problem after that. But there's a very deliberate reason that it became a public issue. And that's, as we'll see in a few minutes, awareness is a key variable in preventing the, the spread of, of infection. Somewhat more recently, uh, I was working as a program manager at DARPA during the SARS uh, outbreak. Uh, this is a uh, acute respiratory syndrome. And our travel was uh, restricted because of this outbreak. SARS is a less deadly disease, but it's much more easily transmitted. The outbreak originated at a particular hotel in Hong Kong, and the first victim was known to have had a room on a specific floor. He was a, it turns out, he was a physician traveling for a meeting, and so then went on to travel internationally. And subject, so he was subject A, and there were subjects B, C, D, all the way through the alphabet. They traveled to their own destinations and spread SARS internationally all through what they actually believe was the fact that the original subject pressed the button at the elevator in the, on the, the, the floor where his hotel room was. So it may be hard to catch Ebola. It, uh, it's very easy to catch SARS. Ebola is much more deadly. SARS is less deadly. And Legionnaires is somewhere in between. So it may sound ironic given the level of uh, publicity, but SARS is less infectious and most deadly. Or excuse me, Ebola is less infectious and most deadly. SARS is, is most infectious and less deadly. And Legionnaire's disease is somewhere in between. And what I got interested in studying was those particular variables. Is the spread of the infection related more to the biological characteristics of the agent? Or is it related to uh, physical transmissibility parameters? Do we need to look at modes of contact? Are the preventive measures and social response more important than the biological mechanisms? How much time elapses? Uh, we saw, if I can flip back for one second, the bottom photographs under the, the SARS graphic. Uh, a lot of people started wearing face masks, uh, breathing masks. We had the same sort of uh, public announcement with the SARS epidemic that we saw with Legionnaire's disease and previously with Ebola, and it got people's attention. They started taking preventative measures. After a while, the time elapsed, uh, sufficient time elapsed that people didn't think it was an imminent threat, and indeed it, it, it wasn't. Um, if people take measures to protect themselves, then the uh, the spread of infection is contained and eventually dissipates. SARS actually still does pop up every now and then. But so all of that is a function of their vigilance. There's a deliberate reason why it's a, a news story when one of these infections breaks out. It's, an, it's a conscious effort on the, the behalf of the World Health Organization, or if it's a regional outbreak, the Centers for Disease Control, to make people aware, and all you have to do is make people aware, and they'll start to take care of themselves. It's kind of analogous to the generalization of an immune system 
from within a single organism out to a society. Your, your, your biological immune system ends at your skin, but the way it works internally is to sensitize your antibodies to the infectious agents. And that's what the news stories do. They sensitize the public to the infectious agents. And people have a tendency to take care of themselves when provided with just the right information. So there we have the, the analogy. If you're provided the right information, you can take steps to protect yourself. When I did a little digging, I found uh, a set of uh, scholarly articles. This one, the first headline here, dates back to 2008, comparing the spread of, of, of uh, malware to the science of epidemiology, which, of course, is, is most closely associated with, with medicine and infectious disease control. The process of transmission and sensitizing agents and a state diagram of infected versus non-infected entities lends itself nicely to graph theoretical models of the epidemiology of viruses, both biological and computer viruses. Uh, once you have a graph theoretical model, and a sociological perspective on the, the spread of infection. Naturally, the, uh, the extension of, of that perspective leads us to modeling social networks. What kind of information can spread through social networks? Not just infectious agents and malware, but information, memes. There are a lot of current studies on how ideas spread as if it were an infection. And of course, when you study the spread of ideas or agents or any entity across nodes in a graph, then comes the concern, how do we control it? We can, there are things that we maybe want to encourage the spread of. Uh, when an outbreak occurs and the Centers for Disease Control or the World Health Organization wants to disseminate that information. They actually want to encourage the spread of information over a network. There are lots of things you might want to encourage the, the dissemination of, but the infection itself is something that you would want to take actions against. And we know the measures we can take to prevent, prevent biological infection. There are similar measures we can take uh, to prevent malware infections. And there are a lot of mathematical models. Here you see a, a, a representation of a graph the theoretical model. The text is a little bit small. Uh, the relevant variables are what I'm interested in, though. These are not biological mechanisms in the sense that, well, this protein mates with, a, with another protein. Uh, it, it's not looking at the chemical reactions. The, the variables of interest are the susceptibility of a population, the level of vigilance of a population, whether a population is infected or not, whether it has reached equilibrium. So there's a dimension of time involved. And those are the links. Uh, it, it's not necessary to understand the flow in this particular state diagram. But for example, you can transition from the node labeled susceptible vigilant population to the node labeled susceptible non-vigilant population. And from there, if you're not vigilant, you're more likely to become infected. So you transition to an infected non-vigilant population until you receive your diagnosis and you become infected vigilant and so forth. So the transition variables are mostly probabilities that govern the transition from one of those states to another state. And all of those variables apply equally well to biological agents and uh, software agents. And that's the interesting analogy that I discovered in, in my research. And it's got a lot of implications for cybersecurity information sharing. 
there were a lot of concrete conclusions in that body of research. Uh, some of the interesting ones I gathered that uh, central reporting and incident response is important to containing the event. So that's the key that the spread and sharing of information. And a lot of those studies is indicated to be as important as the biological measures, the physical measures, the protective actions. It's the spread of vigilance. So that's why the director of the Centers for Disease Control does television interviews, and that's why you see a lot of news stories about a new virus or worm or Trojan or or uh, or data breach. In the, in the in case that it's infectious, we want people to become vigilant and protect themselves. It turns out that very small groups of users engaging in risky behavior are a threat to the entire population. There were news stories I remember from the more recent Ebola outbreak that one particular individual got off a plane and he had the sniffles and had been to uh, Equatorial Guinea, and that became news. That's because the mathematics of that network analysis indicates small groups of people traveling internationally who may have been infected can spread it very widely. As a consequence, the next bullet, it's best to take patching and recovery as, easily, as easy as possible. The, the conclusions from the math indicate uh, the software companies shouldn't worry about people having paid up licenses. If they need to generate and disseminate a patch, it's for the good of everybody. That's the way you generate a social response. You can accelerate the recovery rate, prevent further spread, and generate active vigilance. Vigilance being the key. Now in cybersecurity, as we've seen, all of that is voluntary. This is not the case with uh, the reporting of healthcare incidents. And I'm a little curious, I've always wondered why there is such a broad distinction in the two. If you go into an emergency room and you have one of these diseases, if you can't read it, everything from, oh, I can't pronounce some of them, everything from animal bites to anthrax to typhoid, uh, staph infections, smallpox. I think if you have smallpox, you will get people's attention. Monkey pox, mumps, some very common things. Your condition will be reported more than likely to a state-based health department. And depending on the extent of the, uh, the severity and the, the nature of the disease, it may be reported to the Centers for Disease Control. If you've traveled internationally, it will go to the World Health Organization. And you have no control over that. It's not an option for you to say, I, I think this is a privacy matter for myself. I would rather not share that information. There must be some assurances that they're not going to send your name and address, but actually that information is there somewhere. And it's a relatively easy case for groups like the World Health Organization to make that it's in the, the public interest to share that information because we've proven it's successful in preventing the spread. Uh, even weekly, there's a publication that the Centers for Disease Control issues updating what the communicable disease reporting requirements are. But in the cybersecurity world, it's not mandatory. Why is that? Well. Uh, certainly privacy is the obvious concern, but there are lots of other concerns. Uh, information tends to be persistent. My virus will go away after a while. The information that gets shared on uh, my personal healthcare information never goes away. It will always be out there, and I need to worry about who sees it and how it's exchanged because I want to make sure the means of exchange is secure. I want to make, make sure that the places where the information is stored are secure. I want to know who is eventually going to end up with my information. Is it a civilian organization or is it the military? Now, a lot of people who have concerns about the, the, uh, the current cybersecurity information sharing bill 
have stated uh, uh, skepticism that, well, if we limit sharing to the Department of Homeland Security, nobody in the FBI will ever have access to that information. People are are somewhat naturally and understandably uh, skeptical of that of that concept because information is easy to share. It's cheap to transmit. Limitations of use and disclosure. Once you have my information, how do I control what you do with it and to whom you, you send it? When you send it somewhere, I have no control over it, so I need some assurances. Information accountability. If I am an agency that needs information on a cybersecurity interest, uh, an incident, do I have to log that data? Those of us in the defense industry know that certain classified documents, you have to know every, where every copy is and who has seen it. And after the meeting, did you gather up all the copies? Did you destroy the ones that you don't need? Where is that information at any given time? In the cybersecurity sharing bills, this isn't always fully spelled out. In more of a real-time sense, who's got the monitoring authority? Who's in charge of looking at all the information that I deposit into the repository? doing the threat analysis on it, and notifying the proper people. What authorities do I transfer to them by virtue of my joining an information sharing organization? There are a lot of interesting debates about countermeasures. Uh, this is an area where the capabilities in private sector have not caught up with national and international laws. If uh, well, here I am. I, I run a not-for-profit organization. I can establish a cybersecurity information sharing uh, member-based group, and I have the technological means to take countermeasures against uh, entities that attack my membership. There may or may not be policies and laws against my doing that, and it's not entirely clear even what exactly a countermeasure is, and what constitutes a legal one versus an illegal one, and so forth. There are concerns about the finances, funded mandates. If all of a sudden I have a reporting requirement, who pays for the costs associated with, with my fulfilling those requirements? And then finally, liabilities. If, uh, if you're in an industry that does red teaming and penetration testing, you probably have encountered a customer who has some qualms about knowing fully what that organization's vulnerabilities are. If you know that you've got a serious vulnerability, then you're probably liable for fixing it. Would you rather know it and lay out the expense to fix it, or would you rather not know it and worry about fixing it later? The time value of money is something we can't easily neglect. There are lots of organizations who've taken on the mission of watching pending legislation for issues such as this. The Electronic Front Frontier Foundation is the sort of uh, the, the prototype watchdog for cybersecurity legislation. They tend to have somewhat sensationalist headlines in their articles referring to a sharing bill as a surveillance bill and so forth. But they're smart people, and they raise some, some serious questions that we can't neglect. And this is why I'm I hesitant to suggest that the, the current Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act is going to pass so easily. Entities are naturally reluctant to share information that's going to be accessible to the government. Now, In the, in the Cyber Research Institute, we hold a summer workshop on hard problems. Last year we had two workshops identifying what hard problems are. This year we had a workshop identifying what we're going to do about the hard problems. And the theme of this year's workshop was information sharing. We had a breakout session wherein we asked all of the participants what their organization's sentiment would be towards sharing their cybersecurity network data with government sponsors. And for the most part, the attitude was, uh, well, the government is great at funding the technology that makes this a good idea, and we want to take advantage of all that technology. But we'd rather join a privately organized and operated entity that can use that technology to provide us an equal level of protection 
without getting the government involved. So that just happens to be the data that we gathered in the workshop this year. So now the question turns to uh, what should the model be? We want to have the best technological means to share information, keep it secure, do something good with it to prevent the spread of infection. But a lot of people don't want Big Brother looking at their network data. And if you've looked into um, data mining and big data algorithms on the correlation of so-called anonymized data, you'll find uh, anecdotes about how what is supposed to be completely anonymized data can be correlated and you can identify individuals even if their their names and their and their IP addresses and their social security numbers, even if the obvious things are all stripped out. But we do have these commonalities between the information sharing math, both healthcare and, and malware. Communication of the risk is, is effective, but the mandates aren't necessary. The spread of infection can be arrested by protecting oneself, immunization and patching and treatments. But first and foremost, by awareness. So where is the requirement for sharing in the cybersecurity world? Is there a, should there be a CDC, Center for Disease Control, or a World Health Organization for malware? Now this is where the Cyber Research Institute, in some discussions with uh, Utica College and some of our colleagues in the, in the contractor community, have come up with an alternative model. And I won't go through every part of this in detail. But uh, the short version is that members of a sharing service would like some core services, attack modeling, indexing their data, modeling and simulation, threat dissemination, uh, a secure repository facility, uh, maybe guidance on their policy and their training and doing risk assessments. So those are, we'll call those level one core services that everybody wants to have when they join a sharing organization. But we saw examples where some organizations are sector specific and some are not. It's not necessarily true that infections are going to be limited to a particular sector, but that may be true. If you're looking to attack healthcare records, you're probably looking at the healthcare industry. If you're looking for just social security numbers, it could cross sectors. So we, we would like a model where individual members would join and pay a membership fee, but they would join a community of interest that represents either their common industry sector or maybe it's the common set of regulations that they're subjected to. So if you're a critical infrastructure community of interest, you're a transportation company, a civil engineering company, an energy company, the defense sector, big businesses, small businesses, defense contractors, they're subject to clearance requirements, uh, proprietary concerns, a unique regulatory environment, security issues. Other sectors have HIPAA compliance, PCI compliance, uh, financial regulations, food and drug. So if we broaden the concept of core services out to individual sectors, we have level two sharing. And actually, when we get right down to the advanced persistent threats and the case where something bad happens and a member's data is compromised, then we've proposed a level three sharing where a response has to be generated for an, for an incident. And that isn't necessarily information that's shared with everybody. Not every organization, certainly not small organizations, have the, the means and, and resources to do a complete scrub, a reconstitution, forensics, repair of systems, all the reporting, the regulatory actions in response to a breach. Wouldn't it be nice if the sharing organization could do that as a pool resource for everybody? As we discuss this kind of a model, we, we get suggestions for all kinds of industry sectors, the government agencies, educational institutions, law firms, law firms and insurance companies. These are organizations that hold a lot of very sensitive data. This is a concern for a lot of the potential members so there are implementation details. We've talked about how this would be staffed. Uh, we would probably contract out to provide 
different services from different expert sources that would have to be certified in providing those kinds of services. If they're going to do a penetration test, they ought to be specially qualified. If they're going to do a risk assessment that's underwritten by the insurance industry, then there ought to be a qualification for that. We've looked at the financial models, how revenue is generated. Everybody pays dues, but perhaps you, if you have an incident that you would like help uh, mitigating, there would be an extra fee for that. If you'd like a certification to the insurance industry that you're, in a cybersecurity sense, healthy and deserving of low rate insurance, there may be a fee for that. And of course, there are other costs. This is a business that would have to be run and, and lots of fees would have to be paid. So we've got lots of details in that kind of thinking, and we have a very good audience for this presentation. I would, I would invite uh, comments and questions and suggestions for putting forth this recommendation to the agencies that might help it happen. In February this year, President Obama issued an executive order directing the formation of ISAOs, Information Sharing Analysis Organizations, the Department of Homeland Security has already issued a solicitation. They will be providing funding to contractors who can generate the set of standards and policies that the ISAOs would operate under. And we're looking at, at establishing this organization as an ISAO. But if the law migrates toward the involvement of government agencies, we already know that our members have reservations about that. So it could be that the ISAO is not the right model. We want to hear from as many people as possible on what that right that model might be. You can look at our uh, dedicated webpage, datarampart.org, for further information. There's not a whole lot of data there now. We're in the process of, of putting it up there. But this is something that ever since uh, executive order in February, this is something that's happening very quickly. The state of Virginia is the first state to officially establish an ISAO as a state entity and require state agencies to report to. Other states are moving in that direction. Private organizations are positioning themselves as ISAOs or providing proposals to be an ISAO. So there are lots of cases where you can't do anything about it. Uh, I've given talks on advanced persistent threats where my message is, sometime they're going to get you. It's like the movie Taken. You know, you're going to be taken. But what we can do is be vigilant. You see the, the video here, people being vigilant, maybe not being so careful. An innocent act, sometimes you're going to be taken. It seems like the popular opinion is that information sharing organizations might be our best means of protection. It's the analogy to the social version of an immune system. It's catching on in popularity and it's getting some attention among legislative bodies. And so uh, it's something that the CRI is in investing in quite heavily. Okay, that is the end of my uh, slide presentation. I will turn it over Back to our monitor, Steve Orzello, to address the questions in the time that we've got left. Okay, thank you, John. That was a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, check out the uh, questions we've got on our chat board here. So, um, let's see, one question is, uh, do we focus on intrusion and extrusion prevention while not enough emphasis is on vulnerability removal? It says that most software contains logic, arithmetic, and semantic faults, which are the exploitation points for cyber actions. And so why don't we focus more and pursue uh, zero de defects uh, software? I'm aware of quite a lot of research over the past, say, uh, 12 to 15 years uh, toward that pursuit. A, a lot of people in the industry would believe you, you, you will never come up with defect-free defect software. There is the formal methods community that believes there are mathematical ways to prove that your code is, is invulnerable. That's a debate for a different, uh, different group, I think. One of the things that I do advocate in these information sharing organizations is that they also provide a research service that continually scans organizations for vulnerabilities. So it's not just a reactive service that's provided, but 
by virtue of joining one of these organizations, you have access to experts and emerging technology and emerging policies that better protect you, find these vulnerabilities and eliminate them. And the more data that is gathered through additional members, the better analytics result toward that vulnerability analysis. And the, the, I think the, the more results will emerge. So I, I think this is a case where the power of a sharing organization is going to square more than linearly with the number of members. And reducing vulnerabilities will be one of the, the inevitable results. Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, answering that question. Um, so I had a question on your 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 chart there, the data rampart, where you have the uh, different levels of um, the sharing levels. So say you, you had level two, which was incident analysis, and you talked about uh, limited uh, sharing. So um, so what do you mean by limited sharing? Where would it fall, like just within one of those communities of interest? Or how what, how would you see that, uh, that aspect? It could be limited in two senses. It could be limited in that the information really is not of interest to anybody. Uh, if, uh, if, say, uh, medical records were being compromised, then certainly the healthcare community of interest, maybe uh, uh, pharmacological community of interest, a limited number of communities of interest might be concerned. Uh, the defense sector may be less so, so it may not be as high a priority. There might not be any reason to withhold that information. The other sense of limited sharing is that uh, There may be privacy parameters that under the law, it's okay to share with people who have perhaps signed a mutual non-disclosure agreement by virtue of their membership in a particular community of interest, and that would prohibit sharing across those domains. So it's the, it's the criticality of information and the applicability of it as threat data that might limit the sharing in the same sense that if you take that same logic to the extreme and a single member company is compromised then certainly there's very little justification for sharing proprietary information from that company with any of the other members unless it can be abstracted out to the general nature of the threat or perhaps we can do attribution and say everybody watch out for this particular ip address that is something that can something good that can result from a particular compromise, but usually a compromise entails some very sensitive information that we would want to strictly limit, and we would have to be sufficiently trusted by the members that we can execute that limited response. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, thanks for clarifying that uh, that issue for me. Um, let's see, we do have another question here, and. Uh, so uh, it's a it's it deals with um, you know small to medium sized businesses um, you know they have limited resources so it's kind of an issue of how you know they they can get access to cyber risk mitigation advice and information um, you know a lot of them aren't familiar with it you know. Uh, Small businesses, uh, you know, they're just they're just trying to focus on their area of expertise, and so it's not necessarily, you know, this this is kind of uh, uh, nothing they know anything about. So, uh, is, do you have any, you know, any advice on how you know this this could help uh, small medium sized businesses? Yes, I yeah, I think that's probably one of the most important services that an organization like this can provide. I spoke to a representative from a very large bank and asked him if his organization would be interested in being a member. He said, uh, well, we sort of do this for ourselves. We have lots of resources, and we actually have a research department. And we've got a staff of hundreds, and we take care of it. But then you have your neighborhood bank, and you have your credit union, and you know those, those, uh, those small banks do not have the resources to staff up a cybersecurity department. They don't necessarily have the policies and the training. 
but yet they access all the same transaction databases. And so they are an easy point of entry. And I think for the common good, it's important that this membership model accommodate members that cannot fully pay for all of the services that they need. And it, it would cover, the, the core services would have to cover members of all sizes to an equal extent. So that may be a controversial part of the, of the business model, but it was something that emerged. I had a conversation with a, a representative of a small state agency. She had a staff of 10 or, 10 or 12, and she was told by the state that she had to have cybersecurity policy and training, and uh, the IT department had to take some, some care to wipe every computer when, a, when a, an employee left. And she says, I don't have the staff for that. I don't have the funding for it. I can't hire people for it. But yet she was part of a state government, a large state. And so the risk that her data is compromised spreads to the risk of the entire state. It can't be contained. You know, just because you, you, you're not a member of a very large health maintenance organization doesn't mean that your sniffles aren't going to spread to the rest of the people on the airplane. So I think we do need to take that social responsibility perspective in these sharing organizations and extend coverage to even the smallest organizations. Anybody that has data that needs to be protected, we need to find a way to fund the protections for them as a pooled service. Yes, I think uh, you know. I think that's a that's a critical critical issue. Uh, like you said, you, we, you, we've got the vulnerabilities out there, and you know we've got to um, try and be able to prevent these from spreading. So, you know, being being able to help those uh, smaller entities, uh, it's d definitely something I think that uh, uh, an issue that needs to be it needs to be solved. That's for sure. So. Uh, let's see, another question has popped up here. It uh, talks about uh, the evolution of software and services towards the cloud and uh, the movement of protection moves towards cloud providers. So do um, you think that's, that's an issue? Uh, will will uh, moving to the cloud help, uh, help solve this problem? That's a good question. Uh, I I think it, it mitigates some problems and uh, exacerbates others. Certainly in uh, the redundancy and the backup facilities that cloud providers offer, that certainly helps secure data and uh, the availability aspect of information assurance. If cloud providers are large companies, take your, your, your Amazons and your Googles, these are companies that can put a lot of resources into the research and hire very qualified, the best of class uh, analysts and staff, then you, you can assume a certain level of competence that you can have confidence in that they are applying uh, the, the, the best available technologies to the protection of the data. Uh, on the other hand, if everybody's data is stored by the same provider and that provider uh, has some sort of vulnerability, then you know, you've got all your eggs in, in, in one basket. And additionally, there are privacy concerns. Actually, I'm very surprised being part of the defense industry, the extent to which the defense agencies, the, the federal government, went toward cloud providers. And I think that the benefits quickly outweighed the doubts. But the doubts remain. Uh, I where is my data? Who's who's got it? Who's got control of it? I I don't know. It's out there, and I'm very happy that I can get it wherever I go. But I don't know that there's a good explanation for uh, addressing people's privacy concerns with the cloud. So that's that's kind of a a, a yes and no response to that question. Is is it a good idea to move to cloud providers? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's obviously, uh, you know, kind of the way I look at it. It's, you know, you move it to the cloud, but then it's a, a big target then, uh, that everybody can kind of, uh, go after. So, so as you say, you may have a lot of talent, talented people working on it, uh, uh, but, but then it's also attractive to a lot of folks because that's where all the interesting information is as well. So everything's yeah, always a trade-off. You know, the old, uh, the old, 
the old story, why, why did you rob the bank? Well, that's where the money is. So <laughs> exactly. If you have the information, you become the target. <laughs> that's right. No. Um, okay, I think uh, I, I think we've covered all the questions that uh, came in, and we're uh, a little past the uh, the noon hour here. So uh, I want to thank you for um, you know agreeing to do this. Uh, uh, presentation. It's a very, very interesting uh, topic, and uh, I uh, wish you luck in your, you know, uh, moving forward with this, uh, you know, with with this with this new opportunity. I hope, uh, you know, hope uh, it's successful. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to virtually meet uh, all of the participants in the in the webinar. I enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you very much, and. Uh, well, everybody that attended, thanks uh, Thanks for joining us, and you all have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.